Good evening. This is the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and Harbor Management Commission meeting for Thursday, March 25th at 7 p.m. This is a virtual meeting in accordance with the governor's executive order, and it is being recorded per the state orders. And at this time, I'll introduce Dan Silbo, who's chairman of the uh, board, <laughs> the chairman of the board and the Harbor Man <laughs> Management Commission. Welcome, everybody. Um, we have some guests tonight, so I would like um, a motion to move the under F new business eligibility for men's softball um, up top and under public comments. Can I have a motion? I'll make the motion. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so um, we have guests here for men's softball. I think Tom maybe wants to speak first and uh, you know whoever else wants to go ahead, go ahead. Sure, I'll just scratch the surface. I, at men's softball has been an organization in Weathersfield for many years since I was a little kid. I remember seeing the uh, guys playing and uh, Andy has played longer than I have. And uh, Dan's played, I, I mean, Matt's played quite a few years, but uh, a bit younger before he was born, we were playing. Um, anyway, we uh, are a Weathersfield organization, quote unquote. We are allowed to have um, some out-of-towners play on our teams. Uh, we have a rule where um, you can have up to half your team, up to 10 people be uh, out of towners just so you can get enough players. So you could have a, a roster of 20 players with 10 residents and 10 non-residents. Most teams, mine included, the majority are residents. We've got uh, a handful of teams that are strictly Weathersfield residents with uh whether it's a pandemic or whether it's uh, the baby boomers, you know, uh, getting too old to play or whatever, the number of uh, teams uh, is lower than what it was, you know, 20 or whatever years ago. Uh, way, way back, besides a uh, team being able to um, come in under the, uh, the guidelines I told you about residency, um, we were looking if we can look back to 30 or so years ago when teams were allowed to uh, be enrolled or, or uh, fielded uh, that uh, represented companies uh, from town uh, way back when that was allowed. And the thinking was with uh, uh, the company sponsoring it, they are a major taxpayer in town and we could come up with parameters, whether it's, you know, a half or two thirds of the uh, players on uh, a uh, local company's team, you know, would have to be, uh, you know, full-time employees or something like that. I mean, you can play around with the res. I, I don't know what the response is going to be, but uh, we had a number of, you know, teams like that. Weathers I believe the Weathersfield Police Department had one. Andy, you had mentioned um, a, a team that um, you recall. Vantage Computers, that probably predates everybody except yeah. for Mr. Lepore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I yeah. remember them. In, in the good old days, I mean, going back, we would have 32 teams and we'd be turning teams away. Um, we are at 17 now. Last year with the pandemic, you know, we thinned out where we had 14. But um, I, I don't think we're in danger of, you know, going under. It's just a matter of if we could pick up possibly one or two or whatever um, additional teams by offering to places like Department of Motor Vehicle or, you know, uh, any big companies or organize like the Weathersfield Police Department, which you know, a number of the policemen are not Weathersfield residents. And so that's the scratch of the surface from me. Yeah, I mean, I will say when I played, um, I think most of the policemen played for uh, Oldham Studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I can remember right, and uh, um, it was live or work in town or was it, uh, you could be a Weathersfield graduate too. Was that it? Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. You used to have to come with your diploma. I lived in Newington when I first started yeah. five years ago. Had to bring my Weathersfield uh, school diploma. Um, if you don't mind, uh, while my memory's fresh, do you mind if I follow up on that a little bit? Yeah. Okay. First of all, Dan, I, Dan Silbo, I don't know if you're using a filter or not, but you certainly have an age like the rest of us. <laughs> I'm a little, a little bit miffed by that. <laughs> However, this thing we're talking about tonight, it's kind of cyclical because I remember back in the late 80s when we first took over the league, um, we were in front of the board the same way, um, trying just to expand a little bit on the parameters of eligibility um, 
just to sustain the league. And then we grew it again. Like Tom said, we grew it back up uh, pretty solid. Um, I think that part of the, or one of the big things here is that we've always been responsible, whether it was, uh, you know, I was involved in the, in the group before Tom, then Tom kind of took over and I used my way out. And then I'm, I'm been back in the last couple of years, but uh, we've always ran it in a responsible way, which which I think is really key to uh, the powers that be in the town. You know, it's not like we're giving the keys away of the kingdom to people who act like animals. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just remember the days when, when families would come down there and check check out the uh, games, and it, it just added a lot of life to the town. Um, without being too philosophical and going backwards in time. Um, it's just been, we've, we've had a really good program here and it would be a shame to see it diminish. And again, I don't think we're, we're going to be at the point where we'll have 30 teams coming in so that, you know, strictly residents are not going to be accessing the fields, but at the same time to allow uh, companies that are paying the taxes just to have a, one more little perk in town wouldn't hurt. Uh, that's about all I have. Anybody? Uh, anybody else have any comments? Uh, Mike. Yeah, I, I just, I just have a question. I, I guess and maybe I'm being naive, and I, I'm not clear on it. Who has in the past determined eligibility? Is that this board makes a recommendation? Is that I guess you're looking for changing some eligibility requirements? Is that what the group is looking for? We, um, our, our present bylaws, uh, uh, we drew up with uh, the, the town uh, approving them for eligibility. Uh, I don't know if that went before the board. That was, gosh, Kathy, I want to say 20, 25 years ago. Um, I don't know if it went just to, I believe it was you that were, you, how, you've you been in the town running the uh, Parks and Rec for that long, right? Yes, it's when it's a change in eligibility or a program that does it, we go to the board just to get your input. Sure. They have some additional information as we work with whatever group it is. Okay. Because you're, you're, you are the board members here of the park and rec department. Yeah, so we, we had submitted um, Matt Kaliwa, um, you know, an in-town guy. Uh, he and I drew them up and we, you know, asked permission and I guess it went under review and uh, you and I, Marty Sittler came back and said that, you know, it was approved. So I, I didn't know what the process was. We didn't go before the board. We just submitted the bylaws in and uh, that's the way it was handled. So I, I had asked, uh, I, I deal with Rachel quite a bit and um, I guess she turned to Kathy and with my request, it was suggested that, you know, some members appear before you, the board to present in person or, per, you know, via Zoom versus typing it up and sending it in that way. And, and then something would be drafted, Kathy, and come back to the board. Is that how it would work? No, if you guys said it was, oh, you, you thought you approved it, you, you were in favor of it, then we would just sit down with them and, and put it all together. You wouldn't have to come back. Okay, I, I guess, I don't know about the rest of the group. I, I'm not sure if I'm clear on what they're looking to change or what they're, I know what they're asking for, expanding eligibility, but how, I guess, I don't know how specific we need to know you know, what what the changes are is just letting out of town people in is that I, I guess I'm just not clear on it myself. I don't know if everybody else is maybe is not but, but, need that. I guidance. think the change the change would be allowing people who aren't residents but are working for uh companies that are uh taxpayers in Weathersfield um to to participate in a league um you know allowing them field access which is you know the big contention so this is uh, so it's just going back to the way it was basically yeah years. actually it is we're, yeah. we're doing a little cyclical thing going back yeah. to adding that little caveat back in there mm -hmm. yeah right. the, com so, the companies that were uh participating that like andy was referring to all of a sudden there were no um teams like that that you know companies were sponsoring a team that the majority of their players were their employees and with that, it kind of was fading away. But then with our um, the, the rules that we came up with 20 years ago, it wasn't even addressed to say, hey, you can keep doing that. Um, 
you know, so we, we, we were talking about it. There's a couple things. I, uh, girls have always been able to play. We've purposely had the rules set up that way. We've probably had maybe 10 in the last 20 years, but that's another thing we're looking at to, you know, uh, keep the, keep the league going, you know, as far as, uh, not to be desperate to get teams, but, you know, maybe looking at it from a taxpayer standpoint that big companies, you know, they are big taxpayers in town and, you know, perhaps they should be able to field the team themselves with, uh, number of their employees that are not residents. So my question is, um, you still using one of the Rocky Hill fields, Tom? We are, yes. So um, we, with the uh, approval of, of Weathersfield and Rocky Hill, um, our actual official um, organization is called the Weathersfield slash Rocky Hill Adult Softball League. And so it was agreed upon that um, to use the word resident, you could be a resident of Weathersfield or uh, Rocky Hill and you are considered a quote unquote resident. So sure. we play uh, on one field in Rocky Hill uh, and then we play on two fields in Weathersfield. Okay, so would this include um, Weathersfield and Rocky Hill businesses or just uh, I, Weathersfield businesses? Rocky Hill, uh, um, Rocky Hill with some decision-making kind of sits back and says, let's see what Weathersfield has to say. So um, if by chance uh, we are lucky enough where you guys give us your blessing and we can uh, move forward, I'll be turning to uh, you know Rocky Hill to say, hey, Weathersfield says it's okay. What do, what do you guys think? Um, they typically follow suit. They, they have their own ways of looking at things, but um, as far as it's concerned, um, I'm hoping and praying that they say, okay, if they say no, then it would strictly be a Weathersfield, you know, company allowable thing, I guess. And I'd have to talk to Rocky Hill too, because they have their, um, you know, uh, a, a couple of rules also that I would have to make sure to be on the same page that if all of a sudden we're um, changing the eligibility in our bylaws, you know, are they going to say, oh, well, it's okay for a Weathersfield company to have a team or, you know, or, or not. And if they do, I have the flexibility. I do all the uh, scheduling. Um, any team that has any, you know, requirements, they can't play Tuesdays, Thursdays, they only want to play you know, late games, early games. I could easily get a new team in and say, hey, they're not playing any games at Maxwell if, if it came down to it. I would hope that wouldn't be the case, but I can do it. I love my challenges. And do we have enough... Um... How much space do we have? I, I, it sounds like we've got a lot of space to accommodate a bunch more teams. Is that nothing? Let, let me put it this. Let me put it this way: we we could, we if we don't have to have the half hour spacing in between games this year, like we did last year with the pandemic, and I'm told the indication is we're not going to. Uh, Kathy, has there been an official decision on that? No, we we keep watching what's coming out with the governor. We think that time can be shortened. There still okay. has to be a cleaning process in between. And we have all the disinfectant, and I think everybody's been very uh, diligent on, on that. So to, to answer your question, there's two scenarios. One is where there's a half hour break in between games, which means field one would only have two games. If there's that, that uh, half hour break is not there, then there's three games there. So let's go for the best case scenario. There's three games on, on one, one game on two, and two games on Maxwell. That's six games, five days a week. We could have, we could have 30 teams if we you know, have that much interest in them, but we have 17 right now. And I mean, even if, even if we only play two games on field one, that's 25 teams. But to be honest with you, Dan, I don't know that we're going to pull a rabbit out of our yeah. hat of a team this year. Number one, number two is next year. Maybe we will get one. Maybe we'll get two. There was one team uh, that played four or five years ago, Claris, which is a, uh, I don't know the company, but I guess it's a company in uh, Rocky Hill. And they had a co-ed team, and, uh, but they live by the rules as far as the number of residents. Uh, but companies like that, they may be able to, you know, have enough players that they, you know, they don't have to look at the Weathersfield or Rocky Hill residency to um, get a team together. So we, we, as far as the fields we have, we're, we will never, we used to have, as you remember, field one, two, three, four, and five, and Fuller School. We had six fields and, you know, uh, Things change over time, obviously. And uh, so, I mean, just having two in Weathersfield um, is more than adequate, you know, 
even if we had an influx of three or four teams. I mean, uh, two years ago, we had 21 teams. The year before that, we had 23 teams. Um, we've been as high as, I think, 27 teams. That was probably about five, seven years ago. But the fluctuation, they could, you know, teams come and go and whatever. Okay. Um, Sorry for the long answer. Nope, nope. Um, so I think you answered all my questions. Does anybody else have any other questions? Kathy, do you need an official motion and vote or just consensus or what are you looking for? Just a consensus from the board. I don't have any issues. I don't, like I said, this used to be the way it was 25 years ago. Um, and the only thing is obviously when you start, if the number of teams explode, then we might have to relook at this, but you're not really talking that at this point. Um, you know, to me, most of the people are from around the area anyway. If they don't live in Weathersfield or Rocky Hill, it's, it's kind of odd. Most of them will live in those two towns. So I don't have an issue with it. I don't know if anybody else has any input. Andy Sanzaro has raised his hand. Yeah, sorry, guys. I have to leave the meeting. I just wanted to say thank you. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Thanks a lot, Andy. Yeah, I don't know why we wouldn't support it. And the only thing, I guess, as time goes on, it'd be interesting to see if you could provide us with the details of how it's impacted the group, hopefully in a positive way. But I think Kathy can handle it. She's done it in the past. Yeah, Mike, um, you're, as a lot of you are not very familiar with the men's softball league, um, I enjoy playing, but I may or may not be playing. I have a board, we rule, and Matt will attest to this, and he can appreciate it now because he's on the board. Otherwise, I was just a big jerk with an iron fist. But, um, you know, I'm not saying rules aren't broken, but they're addressed. And, um, uh, you know, you go to other towns, there's fights in the parking lot, there's, you know, uh, unruly behavior, there's fights on the field even. Um, we don't stand for that. And, um, you know, as soon as a team joins, they're playing from another in another team also they, they're always coming up and saying you know what a class act group um and we have a great town to play you know under their wing but um I'm, I'm very much on top of it and if you turn to uh alan you know that uh is in parks and i mean uh physical services he'll tell you we are the one of the lowest maintenance type organizations out there and uh, ask Rachel or um, even turn back to Marty Sittler and there's rarely any uh, any problems that have to be addressed uh, from the town to us where we stand over everybody and have a smooth running organization I believe yeah, yeah. so I'm good with it I don't know if, uh, everybody else certainly if you do something wrong Tom we know where to find you yes <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm, I'm good with this too Okay, I, I think I'm um, okay. It, it's fine. You know, Kathy, work with Tom, and yep. You know, it shouldn't be. I don't think there'll be any issues. I doubt it. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Everybody. Thank um, you. All right. So tonight we've got a guest here with us, Gary Evans, and um, I know we wanted to talk to him um, probably about a few things. One is the, um, I think it was the field issues that some of us have seen and noticed. So certainly let me open it up to um, the group or if Gary wants to say something first, uh, wherever, whatever you want to do. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything, Gary. Or sure, I'll just do a quick uh, Gary Evans, town manager. I think I've met pretty much all of you on this list. If I haven't, I apologize. I think COVID probably shut down any opportunity I had to wander around and meet you at social events. So um, been town manager, I just went over two years. Uh, in the beginning of March, um, but I've been a town resident for 20. Uh, I think I was just trying to remember, I think I coached baseball in town for nine years. So I'm familiar with uh, the parks. I'm familiar with programs. Um, I have two kids. One's a sophomore and the other one is a sixth grader. And um, you know, my wife was born and raised here. And obviously I'm a strong supporter of the town as town manager and also a town resident. So other than that, I'm more than willing to see what I can do to help you out. All right, very good. Um, so I'm looking at everybody here and does anybody wanna start describing some issues that we've seen or heard? Colleen, Sue, Mike, 
and then we can go from there. I can certainly jump in and kind of start um, with a few. Gary, you were at the meeting we had with the league, which was uh, like a year and a half ago, I think. It was like December when we had all of the sports, we invited the sports leagues to come and speak with us. Um, and they, in, in that discussion, we have had discussions almost every month at this meeting, um, talking about some of the issues that they brought up. Um, the issues like um, mostly the field, you know, we, we had that meeting with the, the leagues to get an idea of whether or not there were enough fields and how they were maintained and to just sort of gather the, the climate and the feel from the various um, leagues. But what I think many of us came away with was that um, there were some maintenance issues that we wanted to address. After we um, met with them, we asked to, and we invited um, Sally Katz to come um, and answer some of our questions. And we, we had a lot of questions and she answered them the best we could. But we, we, it seems to me like what we ultimately think is that there is a, a little bit of a breakdown in communication between physical services and parks and rec. And if, um, if there weren't any financial restraints, I think um, I certainly would be a proponent of having a physical services department within parks and rec. Um, people who are um, knowledgeable and focused solely on maintaining and keeping the athletic field um, cared for and on a specific schedule in accordance to, I don't know, like Little League and all lacrosse and all of the leagues that we have um, in our town. A few months ago, I... Um, floated the idea or made the suggestion or wish or dream about having a person similar to um, Paul Schoening, who is the Board of Ed, um, kind of like liaison, but he's not. Kathy, I don't remember his exact title, but I'm sure you know his title. Um, Cody Supervisor. <laughs> yeah, okay. And mm. he's, he's the go-to guy when the Board of Ed or the schools have a physical services issue. He's the knowing guy. He can answer all of those questions. And he has a good understanding of what the board, uh, the board of ed expects and what the schools expect. And just seems like it would be valuable to Parks and Rec to have a position like that um, to oversee the maintenance and not just the maintenance but the upkeep and the um create some sort of schedule for our fields so that they last as long as they can last um one of the concerns that we was that was also discussed or one of the questions that we had was are the athletic fields being cared for differently or the same as green space in town um, because certainly a soccer field um, is getting a lot more foot traffic than um, Cedar Playground, Cedar Park. Um, and we just continue to ask Kathy these questions, but they're not really in Kathy's um, department because they're physical services. But we sort of feel like we're a little bit at a standstill. And we're hoping that you could hear our voice and hear our concerns and perhaps have a creative um, or just a, a different point of view or, or mindset in how we can um, improve the, the feeling of that communication through physical services and parks and rec so that our that ultimately we're protecting the investment of these fields that we own. I think in line with that too, one of the other things that we see is that the sports teams want to be able to do things that 
could be beneficial to the fields. Um, and then either they make investments in the fields that we want to make sure that if the sports teams want to make investments in the fields, that they're in line with what else is getting done with physical services. So for instance, Colleen has brought up an example before that little league um, paid for sand to go onto the infields um, and paid that money, but then physical services didn't apply it into the infields correctly. So it was a waste of the sports team's investments to pay for this to be done to the work to be done to the fields essentially that then physical services didn't do in an appropriate manner. And I don't know, we from Parks and Rec are now sort of hearing the voice of baseball being upset with that, but can't say, well, this is, you know, they, I don't know if it was because they sent people who didn't know what they were doing or if it was a miscommunication or anything like that, because we don't have a direct line of communication with physical services. So I think it's not just that we can't answer to it, but also if sports teams want to be doing improvements on the fields on their own dime, that those are in alignment with projects physical services are doing and then are being carried out in a way that is gonna be helpful um, to the fields and their longevity. I mean, I do know in uh, some other towns, obviously, like the physical service people report to the park and rec department, we've mentioned that a little bit. I don't know that's possible here, um, but we have even talked about, maybe you have a group of a few people that report to Kathy in the summer or, or whenever, and if something needs to get done, they, they can go out and do it. It's not one of these things that takes a while. Um, and it could be, it's not just the field, it's other things as well. For instance, last year, we had a person come before us because um, there are ruts at the, the reservoir. And I'm not sure why, it, I, the example I've given before is like a night watchman, you make your rounds and you check everything. I don't expect everything to be checked every day. However, every couple of weeks, I do expect people to go around and check all the parks and that shouldn't have been, had to be reported by um, a person that come before the park board. That should have been taken care of, that type of thing. When you see holes and ruts and everything, they should be checking certain facilities or pretty much every facility once a week or once every two weeks without coming before us. So it's not just fields, it's other things, which I'm not sure that uh, are being looked at on a regular basis. I don't know how anybody else feels, but that's gonna. One of the other things that we talked about with Sally too was um, trying to get an understanding of what the caring, like the care schedule is for an athletic field. Um, like what the schedule is like, you know, in April they fertilize and they aerate and they, you know, over top seed or overseed. Um, and then, getting um like getting like knowing that they actually did it so it's like the twofold and and I will say when we did have the conversation with um I think it's Rachel who is the communication line to physical services all of the sports teams were very pleased with the relationship with Rachel and Rachel telling physical services mm -hmm. um what needs to be done and physical services was doing it but what wasn't happening was physical services wasn't then telling rachel it's been done so or it's going to take two weeks because we had to order a part or anything so it just as a as a user of those parks when there is a problem with them and you report it and you never hear anything back you feel very unheard which just causes people to complain so I don't think, I, just to clarify, I don't think the issue is get the, the communication between Parks and Rec and Physical Services. And I'm not, I think Physical Services is responding to those needs um, timely, but that no one is ever telling Parks and Rec that that has been taken care of. So that when another league calls up and says, hey, there's still a hole in this soccer field, Parks and Rec doesn't really have anything to respond. To say, 
except, oh yeah, we reported it. Um, and then back to the maintenance schedule, um, in terms of you know, what, what a field should be used. When we talked to Kathy, again, it was like December of, was it December right before COVID? It was, it was right before COVID mm. because she said what the fields really need is they need to be rested. <laughs> and we kind of joked about that as like a board because like they got rested, right? So like now what? Like, are they all in healthy shape and that rest is gonna give them a longer life? Um, because ultimately what my concern is as a citizen and a taxpayer is that I want to make sure that when that, that mill woods facility that is used so much and is really super, it's going to last as long as it can last, you know, like, do they test the soil to make sure that the fertilizer they're using is the proper fertilizer and not just a waste of application? Um, what kind of seed are they using? Those kinds of things are like things that people are asking us, right? Like the more you get involved in these, these leagues, the more people are like, hey, I saw your name on Parks and Rec. And, you know, do they ever aerate the fields? And it's like, I don't know, that's physical services. And that's kind of where that ends. And it really just feels like, I don't really know. We ask and they say they do, but like, I, I don't know. We're so we've, we've just talked about it a lot in the past year and a half, and I feel like we've talked it out enough amongst ourselves, and we want to bring you into it. <laughs> sure. Well, that was a lot of information that I'm trying to digest all at once, um, uh, and I appreciate that you're looking to bring me into it, and, and Kathy and I have had some conversations, and so have Sally, so have Sally and I. Um, I'll try to do my best uh, to kind of capture some of the information that you just gave and, and kind of respond to some of them if, if I can. Um, I'll start from the top. Uh, yes, communication is definitely a, a huge part of this. Um, staffing is a very large part of this and um, that's a very difficult and delicate conversation because it has a dollar amount associated with it and how to appropriately uh, do it um, you know, across multiple departments, because it's not just about staffing and physical services and parks and rec, but there's uh, other needs within the community. So how do you balance all of those needs um, while still achieving the quality of life that we associate with Weathersfield? Um, you know, just a, a couple things and I'm just gonna bounce around a little bit. The, the rut in the 1860 reservoir, I know exactly who that person is. Um, the reality is that that is um, a beautiful area. It has a master plan associated with it. It is not high on the priority because it's a matter of how many people actually use it. Um, there's drainage issues over there. It's, mm -hmm. um, we need certain approvals to fix that right. Uh, it has to have an engineered approval that has to be approved by the state because it's a regulated area. There's just no good solution to it. We are familiar with the ruts. It wasn't news to the physical services or the town manager side, it might've been used to parks and rec, but we are, or parks, but we are very familiar with the problem over there. Um, but there's a cost associated with basically backblading that area multiple times a year. Um, and if I, frankly, if I have to allocate equipment and resources to any um, area, um, I have much have more heavily used areas where I'd rather put those resources. Um, and I love that part of town and I love using it, but um, it's, it's a fact of, you know, we can't be everywhere at all times, so we have to figure out a time schedule. Speaking of time schedule, the, go ahead, Dan. I think that's a great answer, but that's the kind of answer that needs to be given to the person that com complained. And then, I don't know if he didn't get that answer, it. what, then he comes to us. He, he knows so. it, he just doesn't like the answer. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, he just, okay, he doesn't want to hear I get it. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of those, right? Where it's, I would love to solve everyone's problems. The reality is I have so many hours in the day, so much equipment that I can use and so much money I can spend. And so we have to prioritize where we put it. Um, there is a maintenance schedule that is used. Um, the staff, and I'll start with staffing. I think there's plus or minus 11 employees who are specific related to parks. That doesn't, that's not just um, active recreation. That's also passive recreation. Um, 
out of those 11, based off of contractual agreements, frankly, uh, by the time the summer comes around, you're really down to more like seven or eight people who are eligible or able to work these fields uh, simply because of uh, their ability to take vacation time is restricted pretty much from November through um, March-ish due to uh, the need to be available for every snowstorm or winter emergency that may happen and leave collection. So we, we start to narrow the amount of people working on these fields. Um, you're looking at around 600 acres. Um, out of those 600 acres, and I'm don't quote me on this, but I wanna say there's like 150 locations plus or minus that these seven or eight people are allocated towards and that about 15 of them are fields. Um, to, uh, baseball fields, lacrosse fields, football fields, soccer fields um, that are getting used. So you're, you're looking at the majority of maintenance not taking place related to sports fields um, and only seven or eight people to work those. So it is timing. Um, they do have a schedule and a routine that they do um, with, um, with the fields, not only for, like I said, active recreation, but also for passive where they have to be out in certain locations. They do meet every morning. Um, Alan does work as a supervisor to kind of reallocate um, based off of what might have happened the day before, or the night before, um, or the week before in terms of something got destroyed, something uh, is having an issue. Um, they do, like I said earlier, they have certifications. Uh, they bring in UConn um, Agricultural um, School to um, test the fields regularly to pull um, the uh, chemical reactions that are needed or necessary for those. And they, they purchased material, uh, fertilizer, lime, um, et cetera, based off of the recommendations from the Aggie School. Um, and they also receive training through it. So there is, there is a general process that they follow. There are certifications that they follow. They're not um, just a bunch of people on a gang mower out there doing, uh, just cutting the lawn aggressively, although sometimes it may feel that way. Um, they're balancing weather conditions. So, you know, I, as a, as a baseball coach for nine years, I used to get so frustrated to go out to a field and it just looked like crap, uh, part of my French. Uh, but, um, you know, there were ruts in it. They looked like they just got, well, the reality is they only have so much time to cut the field. And if it rains for four days straight, they're getting out there as soon as they can. And sometimes the weight of the mower puts them in, a, in an awkward position where they got stuck. Um, you know, they're, they're, you, every once in a while you get a new employee, a new maintainer on the list. They're not exactly sure what they should do or how they should do it. Um, those do get remedied pretty quickly by a supervisor, but sometimes it has to be brought to their attention. Um, I heard exactly what you said about, hey, the communication doesn't happen. You don't necessarily know what's been fixed, when and where. That's something I think we should be working on and we can work on. Um, I thought for the most part that I, I do believe that does happen more often than not, but, but things always fall through the cracks. Um, and sometimes that's just a matter of, of time, right? You only have so much time in the day and so much time to get the information forward. So those are things we have to work on. Um, you know, these are individuals who are out in a field and while they do come back to their supervisor, uh, they probably hit the most important thing when asked at the end of the day, okay, what was the problem? Well, for all I know, maybe no supervisor is asking. So what did you have today or any issues today? Um, and, and so sometimes that's training. Um, letting the, uh, you know, a maintainer one, two, or three, knowing, listen, when you see something out there, you got to come back and report it to me immediately. Don't wait and don't move on it. So those are all, you know, kind of training opportunities, learning opportunities that um, I can check to see whether or not they're happening. You know, uh, in terms of staff training, uh, you know, the reality is they, they get the certification, they get the knowledge, they get the experience, but they don't necessarily get the, I can't say whether or not they're getting the supervisory experience or being supervised um, correctly, right? So we make sure they know how to use the equipment. They make sure they know how to put the right chemical down, but maybe they're not necessarily ready to say, okay, what's the line of communication? In an office environment, I can go down and talk to Kathy and meet with Kathy every other week and talk about, okay, what are your priorities and where are you in terms of achieving those priorities? Um, but that doesn't necessarily happen with this type of work. So that's kind of a conversation that I can have uh, with Sally. In terms of, um, you know, expert people, unfortunately, the model has been, uh, you know, handled it in New Britain and also um, Norwich, is as you start to lose staff, you start to combine with other departments. And the one that 
that lends itself here is physical services. So at one point, I'm sure Kathy, you had a team of parks, people who were parks maintainers, you know, um, and then at some point the model shifted and that's a cost savings initiative. Like I said, I did it in Norwich and did it in New Britain. Um, you know, the argument is always, well, the parks person is gonna be better trained and understand how to do parks. Well, my argument would be it's our responsibility as a town to make sure whoever's doing that now has the training and experience and skill set to, to understand the impact of what they do. Um, so, you know, we're in budget time right now, we can look at those training obstacles. In terms of bringing on more staffing, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, unfortunately, I'm doing putting my budget recommendation together right now. The council is not going to appreciate it. Um, but last year we eliminated a maintainer position. Um, my assumption is, and I'm doing my best to work it so we don't, but my assumption is we'll eliminate a maintainer position again this year. Um, right now I have it back in the budget, but my numbers are high. Um, and at the end of the day, while I understand the economic impact and the quality of life related to having good parks and good programming, um, and I know the council shares that, at the end of the day, they're responsible to all the taxpayers and they're gonna balance priorities. Um, and as much as I try to sell the quality of life amenity that we provide that this organization, the parks group provides, um, there's a dollar amount associated with it. And we look for efficiencies wherever we can. Um, sometimes it costs, sometimes it doesn't. I I'm trying to think of other things that you might've brought up. <laughs> I think, Gary, on that point, that was kind of our frustration, is that we understood, and especially after we met with Sally, that the parks, the physical services responsibilities has expanded substantially in the past however long, um, and their, their crew has been diminished. Um, and so we sort of left the meeting with Sally being like, there's, you know, they need help. Um, they can't do everything and maintain the fields as to how they are right now. And let's not kid ourselves, they're not actually fields. They're, the majority of them are just green spaces with lines on them. Um, and we felt like we could help with this. Um, and the response from Sally was that we could encourage sports fields to, sports teams to pick up the trash, which we did. But I do feel like we can do more and have the ability to help a little bit, um, you know, but I, we do need a little bit of support to be able to do that. So I feel like having that list of what needs to happen on the fields and fertilizer grass, whatever it is, is that happening? When is it happening? And if it's not happening, then is there a sports team that we could say, hey, you know what? physical services is slammed right now with leaf pickup or whatever it is, and they need help, we're gonna have a volunteer day where we can then seed this field or whatever it is. But I feel like we, we have people on this board who are intelligent problem solvers, I would like to think, and we're trying to help come up with solutions that are not going to add, you know, we understand the, the budget and I'm kind of, frustrated in just hearing that we can't make any improvements because there's budgetary constraints when we have a group of people and a group of sports teams who are willing to make changes volunteering to do these, but we need the resources to be able to do that. Like, I'm not going to just send lacrosse out and say, hey, throw a bunch of grass on the ground. Maybe that'll make a difference. We need that communication with physical services to say, this could be a benefit if you can find someone to do that. Um, and I think that's really what we're looking for is sort of that, how, how can we help? I don't want to just give physical services a bunch to do. I mean, I would love to, but I realize that's not going to happen. Um, so how can we help make it so that I, I, I coach the cross for my kids. I'm embarrassed to have visiting teams come and play us at the Cove when it's, it's like this and there's ruts all over. It's not a field. It's embarrassing. Um, so how can I, as a parent and a sports club, make that field better in a way that is symbiotic with what physical services is already doing and not counterproductive? So I, I have the same question. Um, and I think Gary's probably going to answer it. So what are the sports leagues permitted to do? Um, you know, are they permitted to do work once a year or none a year? Or 
Um, can they do work if there's one person from the town supervising them or, you know, I think that would help us and then certainly help the town. I know you might be restricted by union issues, um, which is probably the biggest issue. Um, but certainly, you know, what Suzanne's saying is true. There's a lot of people willing to help out and do these type of maintenance functions on these fields that would help benefit the town. Um, but I don't know what you're restricted by. Maybe you can go through that. Yeah, so it's, first of all, I, I, I love the passion that I'm getting from the group. So I appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm willing to have the conversation. And I, I, I don't even want this to come out disparaging against the unions, because I don't mean it that way. Frankly, I think I've just negotiated multiple contracts with, with several different unions, and they've been so willing to give a lot up because of COVID, and they understand the position that the taxpayers are in. Um, but in being just considerate of this fact, and I'll, I'll put it in this, in this uh, ex kind of like example. The union f physical services who would be responsible for doing this type of work, um, their job is to protect the interest of their members and, and help eliminate layoffs, right? Because that member has a family or has bills to pay or whatever it is. So part of their protection of the work is to ensure that their members have work to do in a job. And so as the town over the years eliminates and reduces those positions, it's a very sensitive issue because the union fights to keep those positions, not for their own you know, $9 a month in dues, but because they're, they're supposed to protect that person. And so what, what friction gets caused here, although they're, they're fully supportive of of the development or the benefit of having parks, what starts to the friction that gets created is that's great. So you eliminate these positions. One of my members no longer has a job and can't provide for their family, but don't worry, the volunteers are going to take care and maintain things. So it's a very delicate balance. I'm very considerate of the fact that um, you guys want things to look a certain way. The kids deserve, the youth deserve, and adults for that matter. You know, Tom Mull talking about how long he's been playing softball for. And I have so many comments that I just kept biting my lip on that when you were talking. But, um, but the reality is we need to strike that balance with them so they feel comfortable. Um, you know, they're going to throw. They're they're they've definitely shown that they're willing to allow volunteers to come and help. I think there's an MOU. I, Kathy, you gave it to me. I could probably find it. I just don't want to walk away from my uh, the meeting that says how often they're and what they're allowed to do. What and I think this was baseball specific, if I recall. Um, but, you know, so there's probably a happy medium that we can start to talk about, but again, you know, on one hand, I'm hearing, well, what skill set do they have to apply this and what knowledge level do they have? And now I have a group of volunteers, maybe not you, but on even baseball to say, I know how to do this. I know how to take care of it. And then they lay fertilizer down and they burn the thing to a crisp, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's part of that communication of what well, we just laid fertilizer down, right? Everybody needs to kind of understand their role. And frankly, I think it's all because people want to want to do well, right? They want to do things right. I, I coach baseball for nine years. I can't tell you how many times the conversation came up. The town doesn't care about the field. They don't maintain the field. Look at this lip over here. Look at this over there. I, I, I've said it and I've heard it. Now being on the other side, I can tell you what we've done and what we've tried to do and what the barriers are. Um, it's not because we don't care. It's just, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to get done. So. I'm willing to kind of talk this through on, on back here on my end with Kathy and Sally to talk about, okay, if we were to allow volunteers, what would it be? Would it be an organized uh, thing? You know, at the end of the day, these are people who do this, this is their job. And um, if they're not doing it right, that's one conversation, but I wanna be careful not to be taking work away from them and giving them the impression that well, we're gonna give it to volunteers while we eliminate your job. Um, you know, nobody would want you walking into your, you know, respective offices and say, well, I'm going to volunteer. So you're not needed here anymore. Um, or as much, you know, I'll handle that. You don't have to come here. So I want, I have to be considerate of that same, um, conversation. Again, everyone here wants to do what's right and what benefits the community. So that's an easier sell, but I have to make sure that I'm not reaching into someone's pocket while I do it. Kathy, Kathy, I have a, you, I have a, oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead, Mike. Kathy, are you aware if there is a memo, an MOU, um, 
have volunteers been used that often? I mean, has it really been put into use much? Um, well, it's surprising that it, it comes up again tonight because there is a memo. It goes back uh, quite a few years. And um, every couple of years we would give it, usually it went to Little League because they, they always were really involved with the fields more. And, um, and so it does identify all the different things that can be done and, and all of that. And in years past, going back many, <clears throat> probably going back eight or 10 years, Little League used to have a volunteer day at the beginning of the season where they would work with a couple of physical services people who would bring all the equipment and, and ahead of time, they would make a plan of what fields they wanted to work on and what Little League wanted to get done. <clears throat> and that faded out for a while recently. <clears throat> and we just um, shared the letter again with, um, with Little League because they, they have a whole new group of board members. And they said, oh, we read it and it talked about a volunteer day. And we'd be interested in what that was all about. So it goes to the communication because here we're thinking every year, Little League is saying, no, we're not interested in a volunteer day. And we're finding out all the new people don't know about a volunteer day. Mm. So, so, to, so it is there, it does, it did work in the past when they did their volunteer day. And it was, uh, it was a meeting of, of the group and it's been done with soccer too, a meeting with the group, what they wanted done, who had the money, we would sit down and figure out whose budget could cover it and then figure out how do you get, because if you, we got a couple of maintenance guys to work and it was usually a Saturday on overtime and then they got volunteers from their group, their organization, and they had a plan and they, they fanned out to the different fields based on that plan. And the equipment moved from field to field based on what needed to be done. So those MOUs still exist. They're not prepared to expire and they're not part of negotiations at this point. So no, everybody, still... well, the maintenance guys are definitely aware of it. And as we think about it, we give it to the, um, to the sports groups, but I have to admit, I'm not sure it gets to everybody. Well, I guess we're back to the infamous communications thing, because yeah. if people don't know about it, I don't, I, we, that's the first time I think, at least I remember hearing about it, even with our discussions with, with, uh, with Sally. And that was one of the things we talked about staffing. So it would have been nice to kind of know that and, and try to utilize that if it's a tool we can use, otherwise it's going to go away if we don't use it and it'll probably be harder to get back. And I think one of the, one of the things I guess I think of, if we can show that there's an effort and these fields start improving or, people start volunteering, you might even look at, there's probably groups that, you know, you know, might even be willing to donate money because it is all about money and getting work done. And if they're, I think you got to prove your worth because nobody, there's probably not a Rotary Club or Elks Club or any of those clubs that would donate money if they see some of the conditions and know that we're not making an effort. So I think all of this, I think might pay bigger dividends long-term, maybe after we're all gone. Because I think, you know, if you show them that we're making an effort and if there's MOUs out there, you get volunteer groups, I think everybody gets a little more excited about getting something done. So, you know, some of this is just the nuances of how you approach it um, too, right? So there's an existing memo in place, but we might, you know, Kathy and Sally, we might want to sit down and talk a little bit about how it is rather than coming in strong with the employees saying, hey, we're going to start doing all these things, it might be a more of a conversation with them about um, maybe more of an engagement conversation rather than just saying, hey, you know, volunteers are going to start doing this stuff. Um, the other thing I kind of want to be careful of is, you know, sometimes the feedback that you're given, and Suzanne, your point, um, lacrosse is a tricky one because it's relatively new to the town. So there's not dedicate, dedicated space to it, right? I think we got creative with how we could, oh, let's put it here. Um, the fields, I've coached, I've gone to other communities, um, I've played in other communities, my kids have played in other communities. I don't want the impression to be just because you hear that the fields look terrible or the fields are in this condition. Um, they're not always perfect, but they're pretty good. Um, you know, I, I joked around two years ago, 
no, it was last season. I've lost track. Um, the town engineer is from Glastonbury. Um, and my, our kids, our, both our kids uh, are the same ages, um, both his older kid and younger kid. And we played against him in sports. And so I coached uh, the Weathersfield team against his glass that he, and he coached the Glastonbury team. And at one point I walked over to his dugout and I'm looking at the field and I'm, you know, I'm in Glastonbury. Everyone's, oh, Glastonbury, Glastonbury's fields are beautiful. <laughs> and I got to say, our fields are actually in better condition than yours, right? And, you know, there was dandelion, it, like, it happens. Um, the reality is it's not always going to be perfect. And you might go, I've been on lighted where I'm like, wow, this looks terrible. And I've played on lighted where I'm like, wow, the field looks gorgeous today. Um, sometimes it's volume. Sometimes it's weather. Sometimes it's, you know, um, uh, just the timing of when things happen. So, you know, there's good stuff happening out there. You just got to kind of keep an eye on. on, on it. Um, I'd like to just comment on a few of the things that you've said. I feel um, wildly more informed um, about a lot of the things that we've talked about in terms of uh, like the soil being tested um, at through UConn um, and that um, the certifications that people have, I feel, um, I feel, I feel good about that. That was not uh, information that we received um, at our first conversation, nor did we ask about it. Um, but we just, we just didn't know and it, it's been brought up. So thank you for that. Um, I agree with you on a lot of these points. We did hear actually almost, it feels like it was almost verbatim, um, the, the comment on the staffing issues and the vacation time and um, plowing and leaf pickup um, from Sally. So we were definitely informed on that. Um, but it's still really frustrating from a standpoint of a citizen um, that when it's time for the athletic fields to be prepared, you're half, you're almost half staffed because um, they have to take their vacation, not, you know, during, during the, the athletic time, during spring, summer, and fall. Um, so that, that's definitely like frustrating. And I know like sports teams, you know, there's a first glimpse of spring and everybody's really kind of anxious to get started. And I feel like at the beginning of spring at least um there's always the wait oh the fields aren't ready yet the fields aren't ready yet and then it's like well and maybe this is just the lack the the communication issue but if there was a proactive um effort from physical services to be like hey okay you want to get the fields ready well we have this mou and so let's set up this day and we'll get we'll use all these people and get these fields ready you know we can walk the fields and flag any issues we can see what needs to be done and inventory everything we can deliver those boxes the equipment boxes that are um, needed at all of the fields we can um, do all that stuff it maybe it isn't even hands-on maybe it's just people walking the field saying hey there's a hole behind second base at this field um, and it needs to, we stuck a flag in the ground and it needs to be handled. Any of this stuff is gonna put us in a, in a place that's going to make people feel like the town's getting ready for sports. And, and right now, you know, at least baseball is, is ready to start practicing, but, but it's not ready. The town's not ready. Physical services isn't ready. And, uh, I just think in general, I mean, we, we sh there, I mean, the snow just got off the ground like two weeks. I know ago. it's really early, but we shouldn't be on those fields right now playing baseball. Um, but I mean, the the point is, people are starting to think about it. So, if there was a proactive effort to be like, okay, hey, baseball, you're ready, go walk all your fields and inventory all the stuff that that you see that needs to be addressed. So that our people can come out and do it instead of having to inventory the fields and take that time. Um, I mean, even something as simple as that, people are anxious to get going and it just doesn't, it feels like, 
I don't know. I guess it, I guess it just feels like people want to help. Everybody's sitting and waiting for these seven employees for physical services to tell us that it's ready to go. And um, just if there was a proactive effort from physical services to involve the, the leagues, I wonder what, I wonder how different that could look. I wonder how different that could feel. I wonder how the climate could be improved upon just simply by putting it back on the leagues to, to do small things in preparation. The other thing that I was wondering just in this discussion was, um, you know, I, with the unions, it made me think about the, um, like when you have to unlock the gate at a Catone Field, the employee on the weekend has like, is this a union contract with a minimum four hour overtime pay or something like that? Does that ring a bell? Are they doing any work during those four hours that they're getting paid for? Or are they just getting paid to, to unlock the, the gate? I can speak to that because I was, I was here when we actually instituted that. And what the reason we did that is, and <clears throat> is that if people are practicing on the field, it's okay, there is not a uh, maintenance guy there or person there. When there are games and there's a visiting team coming, we do have someone that is on the field and with the, um, with the union agreement, it's, it's a three hour minimum. So what we ask the sports groups to do is to plan their games so that they're back to back. So there's not a period in the middle. So that if they're gonna go from 10 to two, schedule their games, don't have a 10 o'clock game and then a two o'clock game. So we, we do require that they do that. The reason we put a person on that field the number one reason we did is the cost of the field is over a million dollars and we want a security person there that's representing the town and that is watching the other team more so the visiting team but also the home team because even though the coaches tell us they can do it they're busy coaching the game <clears throat> they don't see somebody coming in with a dog they don't see somebody going on the field with uh the inappropriate footwear so that was put into place for those reasons and to protect the field. <clears throat> they are given a direction of to be busy while they're there. They're supposed to be going around, first cleaning the bathrooms, obviously opening up the gate when it needs to be opened, cleaning the bathrooms, picking up the trash, kind of doing an inventory of that field so that if they notice anything, those things can be corrected during the weekday. So that's why it all came into place. And it was really to be, to be eyes on that field when we had visited, visitors in there using it. Oh, okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then Dan, I just wanted to touch back on the reservoir thing. I thought the issue at the reservoir was that there was like the gate was broken and it was broken for months and like no one noticed until like a resident called. Wasn't that? There was, that? A, there was, that no, was padlock, no padlock, no padlock. Yeah. No lock, lock right? And it wouldn't shut properly or something. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, how does that go unseen if people are going to care for the, was mm -hmm. it the reservoir? Yeah. Yeah. And that was also yeah. a communication issue because even though it wasn't locked, the gate was broken. The gate was on order. Oh, that's a right. Gate. So it's not like it's going to come in tomorrow. And so unfortunately, even I had to find that out. I'm like, I, I thought we did a work order for the gate. And then when I called, I found out that the gate, they had to get a new gate then that was on order. So yeah, right. there are those kinds of things that do happen. And, and that goes back to the communication conversation mm -hmm. too, right? So keeping Kathy informed as to why it's going. And just to be clear on, on that particular case and that particular gentleman, I don't disagree with them. It's just a matter of, we have to prioritize it. and. Yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I have engineering staff looking at how to permanently solve that problem or at least reduce the issue because that gentleman is advocating for it and he, he has a good point. Um, so I, I don't want to discredit his or invalidate his point or, or the desire to do it, but it's unfortunately, it's not as simple as everybody thinks. We'll just go out there and fix it. Um, 
I wish it was that simple. Um, you know, it needs approved process material to come in, potentially engineered response with um, with drain with proper drainage. Um, frankly, you know, we have to address issues around dumping up there and people gaining access. And so there's a much larger solution that we're trying to get. So I don't want to, again, I don't want to disparage the individual at all. Um, I do agree with them. It's just, again, got to tri triage these things as we can. Mm -hmm. Gary, I, I just, I want to thank you for taking the time tonight. I think it was, it was certainly informative for me and I'm sure the rest of the group, but from our end, is there anything that you see that we could I don't want to say help you, and we're not trying to dump everything on you. There was a lot, there's a lot on the plate, but yeah. um, is there anything that we can assist or that we can help you out with in any of this? Well, let me think a little bit about that. I mean, I, I want to sit with Kathy and Sally, and you know, it might have to come down to that union to talk to the unions too and see where their comfort level is. Um, you know, I think, and I'm, I'm I think sometimes, you know, when budget season, cut, we're in budget season, but when the budget comes out and um, there's a public hearing component and uh, the opportunity for residents to speak or against items, um, that's a good opportunity to talk about the town budget. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a council that listens to individuals. Um, they try to balance the needs of everyone, um, but they're also obviously looking at while balancing those needs, that includes what costs are. And sometimes it's good for them to hear not only the negative um, related to things that need to be addressed in town, but also the fact that, hey, you know, we, we've got these um, uh, parks and we want a different level of maintenance and um, we want you to consider those as part of your budget needs. Um, because again, they, they, will, they will listen. They're gonna act in the best interests of the community as a whole, because that's why they're there. Um, but ultimately, if people don't, don't come out and tell them what they care about, um, they're going to go based off of what they hear, what they hear. So um, the budget hearings are coming up and it's it's an opportunity to advocate for, for what you believe in. And I think as an aside, we do have a council liaison, although hasn't been to meetings in a while. So that would be helpful too, because at least they can keep back in touch to get stuff back to the table, but they have to be here for that too. Who's the liaison? Tyler Flanagan. Tyler Flanagan. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, Kathy, I'm just, to kind of sum it all up, I think a lot of this, as we've said multiple times, has come down to that communication, and the sports teams really appreciated the meeting that we had last year, um, and really felt heard and uh, validated, and that, like, things were going to happen in the right way, and then COVID hit. So I don't know if that's something that I, I feel like a good sol easy solution to this would be to have one of those meetings with all the sports teams in this in the room and us and physical services at the start of each season where you go over. I mean, I know Rachel has individual meetings with all of the sports teams, but I feel like <clears throat> that sometimes can yield nepotism. And I don't mean that in a offensive way, but that can be what happens. Um, and so if everyone was in the room at the same time and that meeting was done at a whole with everyone and field selection for what teams were going to be playing where was done as a whole with everyone in the room in a more equitable way, then the all, the, all of the, um, the sports teams can have an understanding of what's going on the physical services side, how the communication works, why the fields are separated the way they are, what can happen. And I, I think even just something as simple as a large meeting with all the partners involved at the beginning of each season would make a huge difference. Yeah. Sure. I, I actually, uh, I, that's an interesting suggestion. I'm just remembering that um, last April, nope, it was the April before COVID, really throwing me off. I lost that whole year. <laughs> but I actually sat with a little league and, and discussed a lot of these things with them. And it was kind of good to hear from both sides. You know, they, they appreciated hearing from me. And, you know, I got kind of got their inside scoop on um, things recently from the board. So, and I think it was helpful. I mean, it was really helpful for us to hear from the teams and then to go to Sally and be like, oh, well, shit, they really, 
you know, planning, they really can do much more than they're already doing. How do we come right. up with a solution? And we really, we were in between and heard both the problems on both sides. And then we're sort of like, well, where do we go from here? And I think that if the sports teams were also able to be folded into that whole conversation of, of the workings of all of it, then they will also have an understanding of, well, yeah, the town does fertilize and I've been given the schedule and this is when they did it. And look, it's on a Google drive. And I can tell you they fertilized yesterday or whatever it is, you know, but some, just something that improves this whole process so that everyone, these volunteers are putting in a lot of time um, and that they feel like the town is backing them up. I think a simple meeting once a year, you know, once the start of each season would make a huge difference. I think that's a really interesting idea, uh, idea too. Uh, great idea, Suzanne. Uh, the reason that I think it's a, a good idea is because, like, um, Gary, I don't know if you know this, but the people who were running Little League two years ago aren't involved in Little League anymore. Right. So, like, every year um, having this kind of meeting, you know, if people were like, oh, yeah, I went to it last year, I don't have to go. But, but new people, you know, new members on, on the board who volunteered to, to be head of lacrosse um, might really value something like that and have a better understanding overall of how to, how to manage the parents um, when they're bringing up things and they don't really know the answer to. So good idea. Okay. Um... Any other comments? Are we good? I think Gary wants to get out. <laughs> you look a little tired. I have um, so much work to do. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're welcome with to you stay. guys or the, with you guys, the budget or this grant that we're writing, you know, it's pick oh. one. I'm going to be here for a while. Yeah. No, thank talk. you for your time tonight, to Gary. You guys. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gary. Nice Appreciate seeing you, Gary. It. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone be well. Yeah, you, too. You, you too. Yeah. Yeah. Talk thank to you soon. All right, so our next uh, agenda item are the minutes for February 25th. Any corrections, changes? Move to approve. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, monthly report for February. Let me take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kathy, just a quick question on the um, Cove moorings. Are the people actually registering this early? Yes. Oh, good. Yep. They've opened. <clears throat> they have opened. Um, um, no Memorial Day parade? No parade this year, but there's going to be a ceremony at the cemetery at 11 o'clock this Saturday of the Memorial Day weekend. Is it Rocky Hill? There's a town near us that's having the parade. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Back when we had to make the decision, it was still the numbers weren't for outdoor events. Mm -hmm. So I think my wife saw it in the paper. I think she did anyway. But who knows? That's probably something to change. Um, all right. Um, now we get to the real fun part letters and announcements. So I think you all got a copy of the letter. Um, so what I asked Kathy to do is go more or less point by point. And um, a lot of this isn't ours. Um, it's other departments and other things that, you know, we should talk about, but maybe you go point by point, Kathy, and we can talk about them and stuff. Sure. Um, I can start with the um, Captain Morgan's business uh, down at the docks. We did do it as a pilot program last year and brought it to you. We had no problems with it. We evaluated it all year. <clears throat> we got a lot of good positive feedback on it. And as we do with any pilot program, we run it. We check it out. If everything goes good, we let it come back the next year. It doesn't go back to the board because everything is already in place. So that's how we do when we, you guys approve a pilot program, we check it all out. And then we don't, we haven't in the past come back to you to say, hey, it went well, we're going to just keep going. I would certainly come to you if we had any issues. Mm -hmm. okay. I guess 
just one comment on that from our end. I, I just, I guess, I think my opinion would be, even if it's a pilot pro program and runs smooth, I, I think personally, I think it might not be a bad idea to come back just to let us know that it ran smooth, not just if it didn't run smooth. That's just my, I don't know how the rest of the board feels. <clears throat> We, we did talk about nothing specific, but just coming up with some more parameters or to come up with any parameters for uh, businesses to be uh, emerging uh, at the Cove. Uh, I mean, we left it off very vague that we should revisit things and um, see if we want to come up with guidelines. I have nothing in mind, but I remember specifically us coming up with that idea just so that we don't end up with... Uh, a company that seems like a uh, same type of company, but they end up, you know, uh, not being a, a positive presence at the Cove. Yeah. I agree with Mike. We shouldn't just automatically renew things. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, no, no complaints whatsoever, Kathy, with anything to do with the, the company? No. Not with the operation of both, both boat companies down there. People last year, as you know, it was so busy. People really like getting out on the water. Yeah. Has, no, has Har Harbor Master Mike, have you heard anything up as far as the boating part of it and your end? I haven't heard anything. I mean, Bill Kite's tours are working great. The only thing about Captain Morgan, I sat there a few times watching him. He's trying to teach people how to drive a boat. He's a little too close to the boats on the moorings. I just don't want it. an unexperienced boater to just hit someone's boat sitting on a mooring while there. If he wants to train them, bring out a little further away from the boats. Yeah. So, Mike, you have every right to talk to him about that. And, uh, so that you know, well, I, where you feel I will, they, but I know yeah. that towards the end of the year. So, yeah, get away from the boats, or you know what, go in the river where go up a little towards Hartford. No one's around. Practice all your maneuvers here. So I saw it one time they got pretty close. Looked like the girls about to smash someone's boat, but he saved it. So he was doing his job, watching what they were doing, but it was a little close for comfort. I mean, I, I do think as a service, um, last year the boat sales went crazy. I think it's great that we have someone training these people because there probably were people, a lot of people on the water didn't know what the heck they were doing. Um, so I they think- They still don't, but yeah, that's I, definitely great. It's good thing he's doing, but just, if you're gonna do it, be conscious about the boats on mooring balls. Mm-hmm. We can um, pass that on to Mike. We could pass that on to him also. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I saw a couple of times towards the end of the year. I mean, there's less boats, but there's people going full bore backwards. Like, I don't know if they were sure what they were doing percent yet. Well, I was the one I cost them to say, this guy smashed your boat. Uh, it's sinking. <laughs> if, if, if the guidelines are going to be reviewed, is that something that should be in the guidelines? So it's he gets the message and it's in writing and this is what we allow. I mean, I, I'm not sure what's in the guidelines that were provided for him right now. We, we didn't see him, but, you know, I mean, maybe we can, I don't want to say firm him up, I think back to Tom's comment, but, you know, it's not a pilot anymore if we've accepted it. So we put it in place and it, it should be, I think, just reviewed every year. I think that's a good thing to do, especially because it is the call and there's so many people involved. I don't think it's a bad thing to review it every year and it's only good for this year and it expires and he has to come back. I just, I mean, to me, it's not making somebody jump through hoops. I think that's just common that we should do anyway. We have an entire contract with both boat companies. So we put that together, taking advantage of town staff and town consultants that we have. So we do go through that process. Mm -hmm. And they still have to get like, what is it, a $5 million policy? There's very specific insurance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so somebody. Oh, and Mr. Things. Oh, sorry. And Mr. Randall's um, email, though, or message. I mean, he um, he is commenting on the fact that he doesn't think this business has complied with town code for commercial vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is is there merit to that statement? That complete. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. No, I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a town ordinance, but we don't enforce town ordinances. That would be the, you know, the town side of it. So uh, whether it's police or if it's, um, I don't know if it's building department or who it would be to go it, out and talk to them. It, and it's been referred to the zoning officer. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and that has to do also with his boat, right? I mean, his truck. That's, that's what's like referred. A... That the truck okay. has been referred, yeah. and they'll review the zoning regs and determine what it what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I, that's that's their headache because. Um, so he's parked on his front lawn. Really, it's where right. he is. He's in his driveway. But, he's in his but, driveway. Okay, so he drives the truck to the Cove parking lot, which is ten feet away. Okay. What do we do? Because it's a public parking lot. Right. So, you know, I'm glad we're not the ones that saying this. So I don't think there's anything illegal about parking your truck during the day in the Cove parking lot. So, you know, um, and there's certainly nothing illegal about why the truck has been decorated. Um, the only requirements from a, a, a the state of Connecticut is when you have permanent advertisement on there, the, the vehicle has to be registered as a commercial vehicle. So I don't know, you know, really what the town is going to do. It certainly, I don't think there's anything that we can do. Um, okay. I don't know. Can we designate a slot for him and his class members? What was that, Mike? And just an idea, designate a spot where you can park his truck and park his, his uh, class participants. I don't know. Have a assigned parking yeah. spots for them. There's no assigned spots, but there's a, there's a spot in a code we could just assign for him. I don't know how that works. Why would we do that? Well, if he's gonna bring his truck down there, then he gets the people he's teaching how to drive a boat. They can park their cars. This is reserved for you. So you're not in the way of anyone else in the parking lot. Because there still is cars going there. Even with the last year, it worked out great with the, the lines, the lines with parking trailer here, park your car here. But people still park in front of the ramp, the old ramp, the new ramp. Uh -huh. It would be difficult for us to do reserved yeah. parking spaces because it is a public parking lot. Yeah, I think I just throw I it out like there. I feel like that can get thing. tricky with favoritism and that kind of thing too. I don't. I'm sure it is, and we don't have the liability either. So, and we can continue to work on the signage down there in the parking. It, it's always a work in progress. Kathy, does, uh, does that, he? Yeah. He he doesn't have a mooring or anything. How do, what does he do when he launches that boat? On, for the town, I mean, does he he keeps a boat on a trailer and just launches it as he uses it, and pays a launch fee? Captain Morgan does, yes. So he's paying the normal launch fee that anybody else would pay when he launches his boat. As far as you know. Uh, let me look into that. I don't want to. I don't want to speak to that. Because <clears throat> I, I, I think mean, he I... has a season pass. Okay. Yeah. So. I believe that's the case, but let me double check that. But I, I believe that's the case. Yeah, like it's a season pass just for residents, but if he's using this for a business use, like is there a yeah. the season, season pass, pass? You can be a resident, out of resident, and you just pay the fee, but. <clears throat> we have a, a resident and a non resident rate for season pass. Yeah, yeah, but if he's running a business, out of the cove, a business. And he's there's, yeah, there's nothing that makes it different because he's a business. It's it's like as Kathy said, those are the two fees, which is probably what uh, he has. I assume that he he should be doing that or launching each time, which probably is foolish because yeah. he probably does a lot of launching unless he waits for after hours when the attendant's not there. <laughs> no, if you own the business, I would assume you get the season pass. I would. <clears throat> And what about the other boat company? He has a the mooring. sail away boat. They have a mooring. mooring. He's got a mooring ball he pays for. It almost sounds like with the number of times he probably launches that boat, that you know, uh, should there be a different rule for a company that's operating as far as a season pass? I don't know if if the, the average boater uses it six, eight times and he's using it 30, 40 times. I don't know. 
if you have a company and you're operating out of the cove, I'm just suggesting maybe you have to live by, you know, a different, uh, you, you figure how much you use as the launch and how much it costs yeah. manpower and whatever else to uh, help them to launch. And We have a contract with them that he also pays us uh, a, a percentage of what he business and also a flat fee up front. Uh -huh. So we have a whole contract with them. I didn't uh -huh. realize that. Okay. And how does that work for his, like, because um, he's expanding his business, right? To like. He's not expanding other... his business. Yes, yes. What, what, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, maybe I don't understand what the expanding business is. Oh, he's hired oh. like a bunch of employees who have boats that are do also doing. Um, the training. I saw it on Facebook. He's trying to expand his business, well, but I don't think it's coming out the cove. That's how that's what I'm not sure yeah. about. But either way, I, I'm not against them. I think it's a great idea to teach people how to operate boats safely and properly. It's just don't have like five other guys coming here and running boats without us knowing about it. Yeah. So do you say he's doing it through the cove or he's doing it through some other locations, Rocky Hill, or wherever he's doing it? Well, well, I, I think know there are other locations. I think there's other locations. He's trying to expand his company, but I'm not sure how it works. I just noticed it on Facebook a time or two. Yeah. Oh, there I am. We might want Which to. Okay. He wants to bring another guy in. Let the town know this guy is going to do the same stuff I'm doing at this location. Mm -hmm. I will look into it, but that's not my understanding. My understanding is he's doing marketing and advertising for other people that are in other locations okay. that have nothing to do with the code. You could be right. Okay. You could be right. Sure. I just noticed he was trying uh, to on Facebook one day. I saw he's trying to grow it. Yeah, which could be different saying, locations. Um, his website says they're recruiting and screening captains who want to become part of their network. I mean, unless he's just trying to find other captains to do it for him when he's not available. Yeah. Which is fine, but I just, it should be brought to the town's attention. If you hire someone, you got to let us know and make sure we get his qualifications before you do that. I, I you want to reach out to him, Kathy? But, I, but, but we, we spoke with him, and my understanding is as far as I know, but we'll double check that he's the captain using his boat in our cove. And he's right. marketing for other captains to be part of a network doing their own business in other places. Okay. That's, that's, the case, the that's, kind, that, that's the kind of stuff perhaps in the agreement that that's why it probably should be looked at every year because sometimes people get a little, if it's not written, they think they can kind of, you know, move beyond yeah. that and, and then it gets us in trouble and We'll be embarrassed saying, how do we let that happen? Kathy, you had indicated that um, we get a, a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. Did I understand that correctly? How, how much did we collect last season? Do you have any idea? Last season was a pilot program because no, none of us knew what was going to happen last year. Okay. So, last so we didn't get season, it. We, got, we didn't get anything then. We got $100 last year. Okay. So would this go into the uh, co-fund or is it going to yes. the general fund? A co -fund. Okay. The preservation fund. Okay. So we got the hundred dollars just because he had a business. It was just a flat rate, hundred dollars or. It was last year. It was just a pilot program. We didn't know what was going to go. And we just wanted to see if it would work or if we even wanted it there. There was a lot of things that needed to be looked at. So is, is uh, some kind of an agreement going to be drawn up for this upcoming season as far as a percentage or, you know, somehow come up with a different amount or is it just going to be a flat $100 again? Or has that been talked about? We have a, we're putting together, we have a contract that's in draft form right now that is a flat fee of $500. Oh. Anything he makes over $5,000, we get 10%. Oh, wow. That's the proposal as it stands. Okay. How, how do you how do you track that? He's got to provide receipts or something because it's kind of it. tough to track. Well, I mean, we got to start somewhere, mm -hmm. and we also have you know our staff down there 
are monitoring how often they see him go out. And I also have staff checking his Facebook page. So okay. we're, we're to trying to do our due diligence. So. And, and the other the other boat operator there is it is that similar structured as yeah, far as the it's the same structure. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Some of the um, other issues. Um, you want to know what the proposed changes are for the harbor management plan that we um, tabled uh, from September? I think that was we were talking about enforcement issues. Um, and we still have the same concern. It's uh, we really don't want to put the harbor harbor masters in harm's way. So, um, as far as enforcement issues, were were we looking for guidance from the police department? Does anybody remember what we were doing well, at that, that point? That was on me to to get it over to the police department to have them look at. That's on me. I just haven't had a chance to do that, and uh, I've pulled it out again. It's always on my desk and just other things happen, but I'll make it, I'll try and make it a priority to get it, to get it over to them, okay. for them to review it. Um, next issue is the- uh... Dan, could I just go back sure. one minute? I just, um, I pulled out my notes for, um, for the, um, <clears throat> the other boat tour company, just to give you an idea of last year. Last year they paid us, um, it was a $500 fee up front and then an additional $927. Um, so a total of $1,400 roughly for their business last year. So just to give you an idea okay. of what's uh, transpiring. All right. Um, okay, the next thing is the fishing pier. And Kathy, did you look in the pricing on getting what are we talking? Yeah, we, we were, I think we talked a while back, we were looking to get some of those easy docks and do another fishing pier. When we got the quote, it was $20,000 to do it. And we wanted to reevaluate that cost and, and see where we were, because mm -hmm. that was a lot of money to put, um, to put that up there. So we're, we're in that process of looking at that and determining what's the best way to go. So we just haven't had a uh, follow up opportunity on that. Okay. And then he's asking for uh, certain specific types of uh, docks. So, uh, you know, if you can get a quote, if you're getting quotes uh, with some of those features in it, um, you know, whatever features more or less the town's looking for, and then maybe add some of these features, he's at, looking for railings and different things. Uh, so, you know, if we can get that for ADI guidelines, certainly, just so that we have an idea. Um, let's see what else we have here. We're talking about cove entrance improvements. Now, I know you guys worked with the engineering department, right? On the, so, um, you know, this once again is more the engineering department than it would be the uh, Harbor Management Commissioner or the Park Board. Um, but do you have any, anything about that, Kathy? Sure, yeah, I, I, we had brought it to the board and that was the preliminary plan. And then it's, it's gone now to our uh, maintenance people for them to review it. They have some, some concerns about location, length, not so much location, the length of it, the width of it, the type of curbing that might be there because they reminded me that because everything floods, you might not be able to do an amosite curb because it might just float away at some point. So they're meeting with the engineering department to kind of discuss their issues. Then a more formal plan will be developed that will then have to go to the different town boards and commissions like historic district, inland wetlands, maybe planning and zoning. And at every one of those meetings, there's always public comments. Mm -hmm. So okay. those will be, so we're still working on the actual, it's a preliminary plan because we need feedback. Okay, so. Kathy, I guess the only thing that kind of struck out to me that I don't think you need much, any approval for is the handicapped parking. That's kind of an ADA thing that I would think that we should make sure we have that as well as a handicapped portal. Is that something that I think we should have there? I don't think we need to wait for um, 
you know, the whole improvement thing. Is there a reason that that's not done? There is a, there is a, there is, um, when we put in the new dock in the middle that's in front of the warehouse, there is a handicapped spot that's right there in that area because it, it gives you the closest access to the dock. So it doesn't, it's not out there now because it always goes underwater. We literally have to bring it out, put the sign up, get it all ready. So it, it's not there year round. So there is an ADA spot there. Regarding the handicapped portalette, the reason we haven't, we haven't done that is because there's a couple different reasons. Because of the type of traffic that's down there and hangouts that people do, that handicapped parking spot becomes, a, could, the handicapped portalette could become a little bit of a, an area for somebody to hide in to do things that are probably can have the potential to be criminal in nature. We also had a handicapped portalette at the Broad Street Green that somebody set on fire and it melted. We've, um, we, have, we also have that area that could flood during the season and our maintenance guys go in with the payloader and pick up the little portalette and carry it out of the way to move that handicap one so it wouldn't float away, that could be a much more difficult problem. I've never had a request from anybody that was disabled to have a handicap portalet down there. That's why we haven't do it, haven't done it. If the board wants to see it down there, I'll put it down there. I'm just afraid of what's gonna happen to it. Well, Kathy, are, are uh, we required to have it down there or is it just a nicety? You know, is it required by uh, no one's ever law? told me it's, we're required to put it there. We have one at Mikey's place because that's the the accessible playground in yeah. There's one there. Can can we confirm whether we're supposed to have one there or not? I'm a little concerned about whether somebody has not needed it. And I mean, it's I guess as far as you know, tipping it over, setting it on fire. I think that's could happen any time. So I don't know if that would cut mustard if somebody made us put one in there. I don't think we're going to tell them that we're worried it's going to catch on fire. I think if we're obligated to have one, I, I think we should have one there. And the handicapped park, and I, if, if there was a sign post put up where you normally have that, it stays up permanently, you know, is there any reason that we couldn't have a permanent handicapped parking space so it's not in and out every year because the sign's not going to float away if it's in the ground or on a rock or something like that. Is that does that make sense? So we don't forget to provide it every year because it looks like if he says, well, insufficient, I don't know how many, and I and I know there's probably some codes or something that indicates how many handicapped parking spaces we're supposed to have. And I guess there we are. should make sure that that's, we're, we're up to speed on how many we're supposed to have. It sounds like we just have one, right? If that's all you're putting in, is that sufficient for yeah. that area? I, I just want to make sure we're in compliance with whatever we're supposed to be. I'm going, just, to, I'm going to talk to the engineering department because that's just we we paint lines down there just to, to better control the traffic so i'll ask them if based on that we need to have handicapped parking somewhere else right I, I th yeah I, I think actually i think it's actually in title 14 statutes um that depending on the size of each parking lot you have to have so many handicapped spots. And my feeling is there's probably gonna be at least three, if not a few more. Um, okay. But I'm not 100% sure on it. I haven't worked on the handicapped stuff in a while, but I seem to recall, recall that. Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of tricky because it's not paved and it's not, you know, it's not a true parking lot in the sense that it's not paved and getting people in and out of vehicles isn't that easy. And uh, so they should have the engineering department look at it. And um, I've got some time tomorrow. I'll check the statute. And maybe I we can forward it to you. So I think that's everything on the letter. Um, are other people or other town officials getting back to Mr. Randall on this or what's happening, Kathy? <clears throat> I I don't I think it came to to me um, 
I think it went to the mayor. I think it went to uh, Tyler. I forget who else. And then the town clerk and and he asked the town clerk to send it to you. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I can get back to him. That's not a problem. Yeah, I think we should at least talk to him. Um, at least somebody should talk to him um, and say, look, we, we're looking at these things and we agree with these things. We don't necessarily agree with those things. And, um, you know, this is where we're headed. Okay. Any other comments on the letter? No. Okay. Any other letters and announcements, Kathy? Uh, no, nothing else has come in. All right. Um, old business proposed budget for fiscal year 21 22. Anything here? Let's see here. Working budget. Kathy, thank you for adding the part time uh, mm -hmm. line in there. Is, is your proposed budget that you presented to the manager already, is that um, online yet that if we wanted to look at, I mean, the whole budget, not just the one page summary, but. No, it has, you know. it's not, uh, the entire town budget isn't finished yet. That's actually, I think what the, the, the manager is working on now. And we, we had gotten a, um, an email to um, this, this morning to give them a proposal for a 1%, a 3% and a 5% reduction in the budget. So we've been working with staff on what that would look like. And that could be, that could be some major cuts. So as soon as, as soon as that's finalized and I know what our budget is gonna look like or what the manager is gonna propose, I'll, I'll certainly keep all of you in the loop. Would that be cuts in the board in this board salary too? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could put the one percent cuts with your salary. Okay. Oh, okay. Did um, Kathy? How did the COVID relief funds affect this? It, that's, I have no idea. All right. I I don't know how they're going to look at that. Oh boy. I think it's going to go to the state first, and they're going to divvy it out. Yeah, I thought I saw something in the. Um, paper about how much we were getting. Oh, broke it down you? by oh. broke it down by town, every town. I thought I saw something. You're supposed to get a substantial amount. There's a few, I mean, the cities are getting a lot, you know, like $150 million. And then like Greenwich is getting like $30. And then like um, us, I think we we're gonna get a couple million is what, what I saw, but I could be wrong. I thought that's what I saw. Well, I have to tell you, like at the three percent, we have to eliminate the indoor pool. At the uh, five percent, the possibility of eliminating Willard. So, and and we're we're trying to, you know, we're trying to just hit all the supply accounts and everything else, and figure out another way to to buy bases and balls and pay for the portalettes and all that stuff. So, so what the manager said is correct. It's it's going to come down to which departments are gonna take hits based on whatever the manager wants to do with the budget, so. And hopefully it's hopefully it's on your proposed budget, not what you expended because with COVID this year, everybody's budget is totally upside down anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, because I put everything back in again for my right. request. Right. So, so now Willard might come out, but it's very, very preliminary. So, um, and we're still working on it and talking with staff a little bit about, you know, what can we do and how can we get to these percentages? So um, it's a work in progress, but I thought I'd just mention it. Okay. All righty. Um, anything else? We're all good. Kathy, can you talk about the Nature Center class? Why is that class being canceled? People are very upset. Well, I wish they had signed up. It's a camp. It's not the camp. It's right. the I mean, program. It's the, the Colleen's. The it's a week long vacation camp, right? We do an April vacation program, uh, and and parents can sign their children up for each day for a program. And um, as of today, we didn't have enough kids to be able to um, break even. And so a decision was made at that time. Um, and he did talk with me about whether or not he should be canceling it. 
And honestly, because we didn't have enough enrollment for each of the days, we just couldn't run it. And then he did cancel it and the word got out. And then we got calls that, oh yeah, I was going to sign up. I was going to sign up. And we have to get the staff now. And if and so we line up the staff. And then we also have to make sure that um, that if we can't hold it, we want to cancel it in time to give parents a chance to get other to do something else. So it's a catch-22. And, and I get that parents are upset, but we can't take somebody three days before the program starts. And and we just didn't get, usually we get enough kids that it's not even, we, we don't even have to think about it, but but we're in COVID. So that's how it all played out. It was very straightforward. He was even gonna cancel it Monday. And I said, let's wait, let it go part of the rest of the week to see where we are. And when we do cancel, we get a lot of complaints from parents if we cancel too late, then they can't find other childcare. So it's- a, it's trying to find a balance. And maybe maybe before we cancel it, maybe we learn and next time we send out a notice saying, um, you know, hey, if you think you're gonna sign up, sign up by this date. Otherwise we have to make a, um, we have to make a decision to line everything up. So that's, that's what it's all about. And we hate canceling programs. We did not have enough. As a matter of fact, I have the numbers and our minimum for each day was a six or eight. Well, oh, sorry, our minimum oh, go on. day to break even was 12 students. And Monday seven, Tuesday six, Wednesday five, Thursday one, Friday four. Mm. We can't do it with those numbers because yeah. that's what it is. And um and we try to, and we get that people also don't know what they're doing yet. You know, it's a, I'm open to suggestions for sure, because we don't like canceling, but the Nature Center is a, not a budget operated program. It has to make money. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've seen those, those notices go out in the past where it's like, hey, we don't have enough people. We're probably gonna have to cancel this. And then all of a sudden, everybody goes to it um was did it did you guys just kind of run out of time or why didn't you do it for this program and this is like a big deal because a lot of people rely on this as their child care for school vacation week because it's a full-time camp um so now they're scrambling to find something their kids can go to full-time because they have to work. So it's a, it's not like a, you know, weekly 45 minute, um, you know, lesson about reptiles. It's like a daycare really. Um, I mean, I, I just feel like I've seen those calls out, right? I've seen those like, Hey, we don't have enough people. We're going to have to cancel this, um, go out to like the Facebook and to, um, I'm sure you have like a mailing list. I guess I just feel, I can't help but wonder if you would have gotten more people had a, had a call for help gone out um, prior to just canceling it. I can tell you that Caroline Fizina, Caroline Fizina would, would do that for Keen After School Program. I am not certain if it was done for other camp programs, but I know Carolyn did it a lot. And, and from a like consumer perspective, that is Parks and Rec. Like, so that's probably what I'm thinking of, even though I know Carolyn handles it and I know it's key for kids. Um, it comes through as a consumer, like it's Parks and Rec. So, so that's probably what I'm thinking of, Mary. Thank you for clarifying. Maybe you can look into that. Kathy, is there possible just to do like a blast email to uh, in the future? Be I mean, careful with how much we do through the email system with RecTrack, but we could certainly look at it. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things we do um, in the state for, um, I was in charge of all the dealers and anytime 
and we need to notify something that we just do a blast email basically and they get the information so okay I don't know if your system has that capability or not. Um, that would be helpful for not only that, for other things as well, I think. Yeah, no, it's a good yeah. idea. Um, okay, new business. We talked about men's softball already. Now we have a request from Unico for a car show. Yeah, it's a tentative request. They had, I in your packet, I had given you what they were looking for. And I had gotten back to them to say, here's a list of questions. We generally don't use the green. Would you consider Cove Park? And they were going to evaluate it and get back to me. Yeah. I sent a follow-up email to say, hey, I'm going to be meeting with the park board tonight. Is there anything? Are you guys thinking about it? And I haven't heard back. It's okay. They just want to do something different because they haven't done any of their fundraisers. And they were looking to do something outside in June. And I just generally bring you the board, you know, any new idea that comes up. Um, we're looking at allowing special events this summer on a, a smaller scale and stuff. So it wouldn't be something we would say no to. So if you guys are okay with me just working with them and we'd have to look at dates because uh, the Cove is also used for lacrosse fields. So we have to check first if they're using it on that day. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that we still have to go through. Okay. Any objections? Did, did I? You, you said the cove, Kathy. Is it? I thought they wanted to use the green. They did want to use the green, but we try to stay away from the green because there's no okay. parking. Okay. Okay. That's that was going to be my issue. If they were going to use the green, I, parking I think would be an issue. Yeah, we try not to do that. Okay. okay. Kathy, the only thing that. I'm concerned about is just having cars on a field that are, we just talked about wanting to maintain our fields to be well played. And then we're gonna put a bunch of cars on it, especially if it rained a couple nights before that or something like that, that could really tear up the fields in a way that just is, doesn't, it seems counterproductive. Um, that would be my only concern about using Cove. I don't know if you can use like up you know, use the, how much space they need and if they can have the cars up on the green space where the farmer's market is or on spots that aren't technically being used as a field right now, depending on the timing, um, there could be some damage. No, that makes sense. We also, I also suggested that the chamber does it at Putnam Park to get permission right. to use the oh. parking lot. Yeah. So I, I also did it suggest that they look at a parking lot. Yeah. That, that might make it easier for them too. Uh, but, or even Mill Woods, like the parking lot in Mill Woods, like the gravel parking lot. Yeah, no, they don't like to bring the, the classic cars right over. on the men's oh. softball field. <laughs> and maybe they'll get the light bulb fixed at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> are, are they looking at us? Oh, they're looking at a Saturday. All right. I was going to say, if it's a Sunday, you might even get the parking lot, back parking lot at DMV near the Cove, the big one. Yeah. Oh, I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I don't know about a Saturday would be a little tough, but a yeah, Sunday. Yeah, no one's gotten back to me, and I've, you know, we've yeah. emailed, and I just haven't heard anything, so I don't even know if they're, they're going to move forward with it. Okay. I'll keep you posted. All right. All right, very good. Uh, Solomon Wells House. Um, are we renting anything, Kathy, or? We're gonna start to, we're looking at starting to uh, open it um, with with the porch. Okay. So we're, we're starting to put that in place now um, and looking potentially at June, maybe at May, we're, we're working through it to see what's gonna work best. Okay, what's the, what are we talking about numbers? That's how many people can be? <clears throat> well, I think we're gonna look at with the porch, and it because it's a wraparound porch, we're going to use the 50 as the guideline because mm -hmm. the groups tell us they're down on the grass, they're up on the porch, you know, whatever, and that they use the inside more for the bathrooms or maybe mm -hmm. to keep the food in there or something. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we're looking at. Okay. I know, um, yeah, that's a concern. My, my son's on the prom committee at the school. And they're looking at the Farmington Club and even keeping it at the school, but I think it's 200. 
Oh. And they usually get at the proms, they usually get 300 or so. So they don't know what they're going to do. Oh. Where they're going to have it. It's a, it's um, very difficult. And that's outside if they have it outside. Um, if they have it inside, I think it's 100. Um, so it's the uh, same type of difficulty doing these events. So hopefully things change. Um, Keisha Farm Committee. Um, What's happening with that is this month, although it's not happening this month, now I think it's happening next month, is they're supposed to start getting groups together to get input as to what people want to see happen with the farm. When I get dates on that, what I wanted to do is forward it to Kathy and maybe Kathy get it to all the sports groups because they should be attending some of these functions. And it's not just for sports groups. Anybody else that has any ideas, um, everything, everything is on the table. So, um, you know, it could be from if you want a uh, walking path, it could be if you want cross country skiing, it could be if you want a, a natural amphitheater there, it could be anything, anything you can think of um, is on the table. Um, in addition to that, I think we're, we've gone forward with getting the barn evaluated. Um, I'm not exactly sure where, where that is yet, but, um, you know, I'm talking to one of the committee members, Mike Orsini, who knows a little bit about that kind of stuff. And just from me looking at it, I'm a little concerned at the price. Um, I'm hoping everything comes back where they say this is, you know, worth saving, but, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's not a flat, first of all, it's a dairy barn, so the floor is not flat. It's, um, you know, it's like concave and there's, it's got like rows in it. And then, um, you know, there's no elevator, there's no stairs in it, there's really no bathroom facilities in it. Um, and, um, you know, you're talking substantial amount of money here, but um, we'll see what they come back with. So they could come back with any number of things. One is to demolish it. It's not worth it. One is to, all right, you can preserve it the way it is. And another one is to, you know, upgrade it so you can start running more uh, events in it and it would cost this amount of money or whatever. So we're going to get have an idea of, um, you know, what should be done and how much it's going to cost. And uh, that part we will have an idea about kind of what we're going to do. The rest of it, I'm not sure yet. Uh, we're trying to get input from different groups. And actually, Andy Sanzaro's brother was one of the people that was going to give us um, some idea about some of the things uh, on there. So as soon as I know things, I will let you know. But as soon as there is a meeting, I will let Kathy know. And then maybe Kathy can send something out to all you guys in the sports groups. And then certainly anybody else, if there's Cub Scouts or anybody else that we deal with, Let's get it out to everybody so that we have input from, you know, the community. And certainly the neighbors around there, too, should also be have an input. Is and there something that the town puts out um, to let people know that they're looking for input? I mean, how is that all? How is it being communicated to the residents or that? Well, there's a with? Facebook page. Um, and, you know, we'll get it out from our, just from what I know, we'll get it out to as many people as we know that we deal with and other members of the um, committee will hopefully get things out. Normally we'd have, I don't know if we take something out in the newspaper or we get it out in social media so that we'd have a meeting at the community center, kind of like we do with the sports groups with everybody from the community and uh, everything would be documented. And um, from that point on, they'd work with the committee to develop a plan. Um, I being that we're working with the University of Hartford students, um, hoping we get something good. I'm not sure what we're going to get because these are students and I don't know how much experience they really have doing these type of things. So we'll see how it goes. It's Dan, I know, you, I know you don't have the answer and I probably should ask Gary, maybe Kathy knows, but since the town's in the budget session right now, do you know if there's any money, even if it's just seed money, like ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars, that there's put in some account to do anything if you needed some work? Because right now, my understanding is that there's a budget of zero, which doesn't get you much if you needed to spend some money. So, is anybody carrying any money? Because now's the time to 
probably put something in if they're going to in the budget session right now. I can ask the manager. I haven't put anything in my budget, but I can ask him if he's put any in his budget. I mean, it's just it's just to earmark something, but it you know because I think the town seems to think that they're going to do all this work and it's not going to cost anything, and that's it's mm -hmm. going to we're going to have these conversations ten years from now. We're going to talk about the same thing. Yeah. Sure. Um. Okay, board member comments. Anything else? Everybody looks tired. All real right. quick, real quick, and then I'll let Tom have his moment. Um, can <laughs> we, Kathy, if you it can, uh, what I was hearing from Gary was that um, he's encouraging people to come and speak about budgetary hearings. Um, and so if we, if you can maybe just send out a reminder email when the town, when the critical hearings for people to come and support, I would hate to see someone from physical service, a position from physical services be cut, um, you know, and the other impact that would have. So if we can be, um, if you think of it and you know that town meeting is coming up and then make us aware and then we can make sports teams aware and, you know, get public comment about those things, I think is pretty critical. No, I'll be happy to. Thank you. It is a set date. I just don't, they haven't sent the calendar out to us yet. Okay. It's usually a Monday night, but in April. I'm just not sure which one it is. And they're still doing Zoom meetings for those two as well, Kath? I believe so. The council is still Zoom. Yeah, okay. Even if we just know it then so we can write letters because that seems yeah, to be the no, easier thing to do is the whole Zoom getting on to public comment is a pain in the butt, but um, just sending in letters and having sports teams do the same, I think is very important with that. Sure. No, I'll be happy to. Okay. Um, Harbor Management Commission. Um, Mike, do you, uh, you have anything to report at this point? Bowling season is coming. People are starting to enjoy it. <laughs> Kathy, is the harbor boat, master boat in for service here or not yet? I haven't heard that the engine has come in yet. Yeah, me either. That's what I was asking. So usually I would have heard, and it's been, I think it was, four, uh, I thought it was it's four weeks. It's four weeks into that, so it's, it's probably due soon, but I would think figure it out. around that time. I thought it was three or, four, three or four weeks, something like that. If yeah. I remember. Yeah. yeah, beautiful date. So, as long as I have it for the season, I'm more than happy. I appreciate the town going above and beyond to get the motor. And I appreciate their effort. Like last year, I remember when the season started, Kathy, Rachel, the fire department, police department all came down, made up a game plan for the year, which definitely helped this year, I think. And even the tenants, like Dominic, who will call me, say, Checking on boats, you'll call me. This one looks funny. Come look at it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're coming. I think the boat's sinking this year. I, mean, I went there, I'm like, it's leaning, but I think it's just waterlogged, but it's fine. It's still floating. <laughs> um, I have no complaints. Is the DEP going back this year? Yes. That's good. Yeah. Right now, I think what the construction company is both tied up to the dock. That is correct. Which is fine. I mean, favorite time to get it done, get it done now before uh, the season starts. Truly, yes. Hopefully. Hopefully. Mike is referencing there's a, um, a safety boat that is used when they're working on the bridge, and we gave them permission to tie up at the dock. Okay. Uh, do we have any okay. deposits on any of the moorings or anything? Kathy, anybody? Yeah, I, I don't know the number, but people have purchased moorings. Okay. Very good. It's only March still, so that's, that's a good sign. Yeah. No, like I applaud the town for doing what they do for it. So they make my life easier. <laughs> well, that's good. So um, I don't have anything else. Does anybody else have anything? I do. Oh, I'd like to make a motion oh, God. Oh. to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second it. How's that? 
Oh. All, right, all in favor. <laughs> all right. Well played, right. Colleen. Well played. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm just going to hold on. Have a good night. Yeah, yeah good night, everybody. <laughs> see all of you. Yeah. Bye bye. bye, -bye.